Hello, how are you today? I'm good, thank you. What a fascinating discussion and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Absolutely, thank you so much for joining us. So uh, to get started, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, where you're living, some of the different places you've uh, traveled and worked. Okay, so I, my story is very typical of people from the Caribbean. I was born in England, I grew up in the Caribbean, I went back to England as an adult and I now live in Barbados. That's the, that's the condensed version. Uh, the upshot of that, of course, is that I have had the opportunity in relation to this discussion to experience racism in multiple countries. I lived in France for a while as well. <laughs> okay. uh, and of course, it's very different. Experiencing it as a tourist is, is very different from experiencing it when you live there, for example. Okay. So, for example, when I lived in France, I lived in a town, I lived in Nîmes, which is in the south of France. And honestly, I'm not sure any of those people had ever seen a black person before. So I would get people following me around and pointing because I was such a strange sight. And those were the good ones. Okay. <laughs> those were the good ones. Um, so it, it, it's very, it, it's very, it's very interesting. And uh, I know you and I were talking the other day. And I mentioned that even for us in the Caribbean, though, you know, we don't, we don't live in, we don't live in the U.S., but the George Floyd murder and all the others and all the many, many others over the last decades always affect us too. And part of that is because, of course, we share a history of enslavement. Okay. Uh, black people... Um, we're not native to the Caribbean region as far as we know, <laughs> okay? Uh, we were all brought here. And in fact, what uh, many people may not be aware of, which is, a, I would call a dubious honor, is that because Barbados itself was one of the earliest societies of enslaved Africans, the people in the South used the slave code that they developed here in order to develop the one that they eventually used in the US. Okay, so, so there's that sort of linkage. There's the fact that many of us have friends and relatives. You mentioned that my sister's on the call. I have a couple of cousins, male cousins. So I'm always very aware that they are facing these issues every time they go out. I myself, okay, I, I am, uh, I'm pretty tall, about 5'10". I wear my hair short. So I remember being in England and it was winter and I had on my winter clothes, which make you look kind of androgynous. And so if I walked up to people, they would draw away the same way that they do in the US if they think of, you know, if a black man walks up to them and they think they're about to be robbed. Okay, so I've actually had personal experience of that as well. And then, of course, in the Caribbean, the same conversations that you're having there in the US, we're now also having to have, I mean, particularly in Barbados. And I, I mentioned Barbados in particular because Barbados was one of the least diverse societies in the sense that at the time it had a population of white colonizers and a population of African slaves. It has become more diverse since, okay? And so the relationships between the two groups were much more polarized. And that pyramid that Dr. Jelani was talking about obviously also existed with the darker skinned people right at the bottom. And that has woven its way into the fabric of our society and has been largely unexamined since, well, since emancipation in 1838, since the independence of Barbados and other countries in the Caribbean between the 1960s to the 1980s. I, right, you know, here in Barbados, the descendants of colonizers and plantation owners still hold the majority of the financial muscle. They're the ones who, that own many of the businesses. They're the ones that have generational wealth to pass on to their children. They're the ones that don't have trouble coming up with, you know, 
with money to send their children off to college. <laughs> you know, they're the ones who can give jobs to their relatives. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying, and, and it's weird because a lot of people have asked me, uh, because as you know, April, I've been writing about this inspired. I've been writing about what it's like to exist while black, particularly in a work context, but also in other contexts. And they've said, so why is this an issue for you in Barbados? Barbados is a country where black people are in the majority. But you have to look beyond the prime minister and the business owners and the lawyers and the doctors and the accountants. And you have to look at where the wealth is, the financial muscle. And I'm not saying that there aren't black people who are wealthy, who have a little power, but the majority of them are not people that look like us. Okay. <laughs> so kind of that's the first thing to start with yeah right right so basically a lot of what we talk about here in the u.s with the challenges for black people it's it's not limited to our location it's it's really everywhere and um and you uh have you know uh, written a lot about what it looks like you know there in barbados and in the caribbean but also worldwide because like you said you've worked and travel uh, many places and and you've observed hey you know wow you know this same thing is happening everywhere absolutely absolutely uh, for in terms of my working life uh, I spent a lot of it in England and you get the same sort you get the same sorts of issues you get the double take. I mean, with a name like Sharon Hurley or Sharon Hurley Hall, you know, you get the call for an interview and you walk in and they do this double take because that's not what they're expecting to see. And at that point, no matter how qualified you are, you're probably not going to get the job. And I, you know, I know of this in one particular case because a white colleague and I interviewed for the same job and we both knew that I was the better qualified candidate, but I was not the white candidate and she got the job which she was embarrassed about, but you know, I wasn't surprised at all. You get the, a lot of something that a lot of people have been talking about in the US, the, 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 the loneliness, the pressure of being the one black employee in a particular enterprise. You're the one they look at anytime, any, anytime anyone else mentions diversity or is used to do with black people, they look at you. And if you mention them, they roll their eyes because you're the black person talking about these issues again, right? So there's, there's, there's all of that. But, uh, you know, in the, in the Caribbean context, in the Barbadian context, we're only now, and I, I mean, literally in the last three weeks, I've seen more black and white Barbadians engaging with this history and what we need to do about it. And should certain statues come down because we have statues too right and and i agree with dr jelani you know don't let us let these things distract us from having the real conversations and dismantling the real structures that need to be dismantled in order for us to progress statues are all very well and good you know stick them in a museum give them some context but make make some effort to make life more equitable Okay, not equal, as you were saying, but equitable. Yeah. And uh, I wrote a book actually about, it was called Ex Exploring Shadism, about the colorism phenomenon in Barbados. And it dealt a little bit with, uh, with how it is treated in other parts of the Caribbean, but the, the main body of the research was done in Barbados because of that societal polarization, you know, when you, black people and white people on the surface appear to mix, you know, we go to the same schools, we work in the same places, but we don't socialize outside of that. You know, you might meet on the sporting field. If it's a work related function, you might be there. There are certain things that everybody takes part in, but you won't necessarily find them going to each other's homes. Right. And we're talking, you know, this is, century, this is centuries later. There are exceptions, but it's extremely unusual. And so I interviewed people about their experiences. And the overwhelming view was, if you're white, you're still at the top of the tree. If you're light-skinned, then there are more opportunities open to you. 
Uh, and while I would say there's probably there's more mobility now, there are more black people who own businesses, I still don't think that they represent the majority of the financial wealth in the society. Uh, and so that's an issue that we have to deal with. We have to deal with the, the legacy of, of those polarized attitudes as well. There are people that by virtue of either being lighter or being so-called white, because that's a whole other issue, uh, feel that they have a, position, a particular position in society feel that a certain deference is due to them, feel that they are in a good position to look down on others who are darker or less privileged. And that's just the way it is. And while in a lot of cases they may not be open about it, it is obvious. You know, we all know how to recognize racism when we see it, right? <laughs> so you can tell when it's happening. Right, and so, and so, the real significance of your book in your location especially is that although Barbados has one of the older histories of racism and slavery in the Americas, mm -hmm. it's sort of late in that sort of self-reflection and examination of the issues there. Yes. And so you, you sort of gotten that work started and you and I were talking just the other day about how even though you did the work, you know, your research happened at one time, mm -hmm. but it was much later by the time that you decided, you know what, for some reason, this problem is bigger than I thought. I, it's still really relevant. I'm going to go ahead and publish it. But then even then, it wasn't until now that your book really has some context to live beyond, you know, your yeah. storage closet, you know, <laughs> you know, like beyond Barbados, you know, it, you know, it's like, it's finally relevant to our whole population. Right. And we talked about um, the sad reality of what it took for these issues to finally become relevant to someone besides, you know, the small niche of people who care about it. Exactly. Right. Uh, you know, can, can you talk a little bit about that? Exactly, exactly. It is, it is sad that you had to see, watch somebody die on television or on video before we were prepared to talk about these issues that we all know have been going on for centuries or for decades, depending on where you decide you're counting from. Okay, centuries if you're counting history of enslavement, decades if you're counting independence and civil rights. Yeah. It's, it's, you, I think for many of us, it really sort of got us in the heart. And so I, for one, because often when you talk about these issues, it's seen as unprofessional. But I got to the point where I couldn't keep quiet anymore. <laughs> and so I have been sharing stories. And I don't consider that I'm particularly special in this. Every black person I know can tell stories like this and worse. Okay, but I have been sharing my experiences of being a black woman in workplaces in the UK, a black person visiting the US, a freelancer who didn't put her picture up for the first five years just in case it counted against me. And I know that it did in a couple of places until I decided that I would just use that to weed out people I didn't want to work with. And the sad thing is that it is, it is still relevant. I did this research a long time ago. I actually didn't get around to launching the book until last year. And at the book launch, people came up to me and said, young people, this is still happening. This is happening in my school. People said, this is happening in my workplace. People said, I have stories to tell. This is happening today. I know, for example, in Barbados, all the beaches are public, but the hotels can, you know, put their loungers out up to a certain point. I myself was ex have experienced where the manager of one beach club came out and started yelling at the black people for taking advantage of, this, of, of their facilities, which we weren't, but the white people who actually hadn't paid and were taking advantage of the facilities were left to get on with it. You know, there are places where up to the 80s, 20 something years after supposed independence, people of a darker hue were not welcome. And many of us still 
are a little hesitant to go into some some places. You know, there are, there are definitely places where white Barbadians hang out and black Barbadians hang out. Uh, you know, and that's that's how it is. And and so I felt like it it was time to speak about it. And amazingly, I wondered if this was going to lose me friends and clients. And it may have done, but they haven't bothered to speak to me about it. But actually, I have found that people, black and white, have been response have been very responsive. Black people have been saying, "Oh, thank goodness, it's not just me." I thought, I, you know, and white people have been saying, "Wow, I had no idea this was going on." And I'm thinking, "Well, okay, fine, but now you know. What are you going to do about it?" Okay, you no longer have the luxury of ignorance. And I feel that. Writing, is, writing is, is the gift that I've been given. And so it's up to me to do my part by writing these stories and sharing them. That's kind of where I am at the moment. Um, yes, and you know, just um, um, at the end of our previous section, that's one of the things that came up was how, you know, in the US, Hollywood has been so irresponsible in, tell, in telling our stories mm -hmm. and not including our own voices and telling the stories on our behalf and doing a bad job of it. And yeah. for the longest time, we didn't really have any platform to break through what they were saying. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the really, uh, well, really one of the many things that I admire about you is that you've done such a great job in building up a platform for yourself. Um, and so that when it was finally time to become public about these things, you weren't starting from the bottom or starting from scratch saying, hey, listen at me. You really had um, a strong following and you, know, you were maybe risking losing it, but you decided it's important enough, I'm gonna take a chance. You know, anybody who decides they hate me, you know, hate to hell with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but but you know like just uh just uh talk talk um uh talk a little bit about how you built up your platform where where did you start as a writer and how did you get to where you are today and how did being black and barbarian you know how, how did that change <laughs> you know okay so there there my my writing career can be divided into two segments and the, one of them spans Barbados and the UK which is when I worked as a journalist. I worked for a couple of Caribbean publications and then I moved to the UK and I worked for trade magazines there and in between there I taught journalism and helped develop a master's program in journalism at Coventry University in the UK and then after that I decided to go freelance and then I moved back to the Caribbean moved back to Barbados and it was very interesting. I think it happened at the right time because the technology was there to allow me to run a freelance writing career from an island in the Caribbean. Now Barbados happens to be one of the most connected places in the Caribbean. So that was, that was a, a factor in my favor for sure. Uh, and when I, when I restarted, I'm not going to go all the way back, when I restarted 15 years ago as a freelancer, I had been out of the game for a few years and I just took the opportunity to learn everything I could. I blogged, I talked to people, and some of those people that I blogged with in 2005, I'm still talking to today. You know, we still, you know, we move in and out of each other's lives and working lives and so on. And what has worked for me particularly is because I started out testing things online, learning how to use them and writing about them. So in the process of doing that, I met up with people. I, I, um, I won a blogging competition and realized I could get paid to blog. That led to me getting a gig blogging about blogging and WordPress. Then that led, I got a travel blogging gig then that led, and you know, so it's been, it's been incremental steps. I started blogging about blogging and writing and freelancing. Then I started blogging about social media, which was a way to promote your blog. And then I started blogging about digital marketing and content marketing. And so they've all kind of built on each other. And so over the course of time, 
I have just, you know, I have these contacts and I mean, some of them, not all of them are on social media. Some of them are writers that I connect with in writers forums. And, you know, I was talking with my sister the other day, she and I co-host a, a podcast, The Introvert Sisters. And we were talking about the fact that you can't divorce who you are as a black woman from your working life. And that is what many people try to do. You know, people try to do it to us and we try to do it to ourselves as well because we want to get our jobs, we want to get on, we want to do the things, we want to live the dream. But honestly, we can't divorce who we are as black people from who we are as working people. That's just not possible. And so I, having come to that realization, having been motivated by these horrible events, I've said, okay, this is all of who I am and I'm going to tell you about what it's like and when you know when I tell you you no longer have the luxury of ignorance you have to do something about it right and even on the podcast we which is basically about introversion we did a, a, an episode which was all about what do people do after blackout Tuesday what do we do you know posting a black square on social media is all very well and good but what are you actually going to do that is going to make things better so it's about bringing together all the facets of yourself using the gifts you have in order to make a difference in whatever way you can. I don't consider, I don't have a huge platform, you know, a few thousand followers here or there, but it's, it's the platform I have, it's the audience I have. And if I can reach someone in that audience and they can reach someone else, then it's a ripple effect. So everybody has to do what they can do. I think that's where I am now. Right. And that's the power of social media and social networking, right? Absolutely. Is that you, you know, may have a small circle of influence, but within your circle is even more influence. And so, you know, directly you may impact, you know, a handful of people or a thousand people, but then from there you can, in the long term, you have the power within yourself and within your work and your circle of influence to reach millions. Absolutely. And, you know, when, when, when we're talking about how to bring about real change and starting at the level of the individual, that's how we can start, right? I agree. I totally agree. You do what you can do. You reach who you can reach and you hope that those people can reach more people and then we can effect real change. Absolutely. Well, Sharon, thank you so much uh, for talking with us. Um, really quick, before we open it up for questions, I want to uh, introduce your sister, uh, Lisa Hurley, and I'd love for you guys to talk a little bit about your podcast, The Introvert Sisters, and how you're using your podcast to also talk about these issues and reach more people. Okay. Lisa, do you want to well, ha hello, everybody, and uh, thanks so much. Um, thanks for, for having me. Um, yes, yeah, so I, like Sharon, I am a writer as well, and uh, we do co-host the Introvert Sisters podcast, and uh, it really is about us, as, as Sharon alluded to, exploring the totality, ensuring the totality of who we are. Um, yes, yes, we're, we're introverts, Yes, we are women of color or black women, whichever expression you prefer, and bringing all of that together to try and positively influence, um, influence our community and, and, our, and our listeners. Uh, a lot of it has to do with healing, which is part of the premise for uh, this forum that we're in right now, right? Yeah. So part, part of the premise of, of the podcast is healing, healing wounds that we've experienced um, as uh, as introverts, who it, it, for, in general society, especially American society, uh, tends to favor extroversion, and so yes, if you're an introvert living in an extroverted world, you know there are certain wounds that you're going to experience. Of course, when you layer that, the intersectionality of that with um, being a woman and with being black, you know there are many many layers of uh, layers to unpack. And so that's part of what we're trying to do for ourselves. And in so doing, hoping to bring other people along and help, help them heal as well. Yes, agreed. And the thing is that when we started the podcast, we didn't realize that this was going to be our mission. 
you know, this has, this has come about as we have progressed. This was, if you could call it such a pandemic project, something that we had planned to do for a long time. And we said, okay, now's the time. Okay. And so we started it literally in, I think we ran in April. We've mm -hmm. just wrapped season one. And what we have found is somewhere about midway through, we started focusing more on issues that affect us as black introverts. And so you'll get a real mix. You'll get a real mix. And we, we, we made a de decision when we did our sort of wrap up, what are we going to do with this next season? That we're bringing all of ourselves to the table. And therefore, sometimes we'll be talking just about introversion, but sometimes we'll be talking about what it means to be a black woman introvert as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, really quickly for anyone in our audience who may not be familiar, uh, what is an introvert and what are the challenges facing introverts? Uh -huh. Sharon, okay. I'm going to completely leave that one in your lap. <laughs> <laughs> okay, really quickly, an introvert is someone who thrives more on an inner world and is less uh, less derives less of, of him or her or themselves from external stimulation. Extroverts are more social butterflies and that feeds them, but what feeds extroverts tends to drain introverts. Yeah? And what was your second question, April? Sorry. And so what, what challenges are introverts facing? <laughs> and Can then, I, well, you know, I, how does being Black shape on top of that? That yes, I, I certainly can, um, particularly when it comes to the work world, because one tends to be a little quieter. Um, often you are, let's say, passed over for promotion, or before you even get to that point, people might actually think that you're not particularly intelligent because maybe you're not speaking up in meetings or you're oh, not yeah. conversing as much as other people. And so you might be sitting there in a in a large group and just 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 being quiet now in your brain you're processing and analyzing everything but of course no one on the outside sees that so they sort of think that you're this lump of coal <laughs> sitting there not not engaging and therefore because you're not engaging they assume that you're not intelligent um and i'm sure we can all see here where uh, particularly in a career you know in in, in professional fields if you're considered unintelligent, that is not going to work in your favor, right? Right off the bat, it's it's already it's already sort of a, a mark against you. So that has serious impacts to uh, your promote your promotability, and of course your your income. You yeah. you get passed over for opportunities, you get passed over for promotions, and that affects your personal bottom line. And if I could um, add. You know, this is just, this is not just your imagination Be because what happens is it also as a black person that mm -hmm. plays into pre-existing stereotypes. I actually have a story about this because when I first went to live in England, I ad attended a job workshop and I was sitting there. It wasn't teaching me anything. Okay. It was one of these boxes you had to tick, right? I was sitting there just taking it all in. And then at the end of the day, we had some tests, aptitude tests. And when, I, when the guy saw my results, which were off the scale in writing, <laughs> right? He said, boy, I really thought you were stupid because you sat there and you didn't say anything. And I mean, he said it just like that. And that is because I was quiet and I was black as well. He assumed, he looked at the color of my skin and assumed I wasn't getting it. That was what happened first. So there was a, it was a, it was a, the, a way in which both being black and an introvert played into that negative stereotype. That's just one example. And of course, let's not, the open plan office, which so many people love, <laughs> especially in America, but also in other places, that is anathema to introverts because we don't do our best work surrounded by noise. I'll just leave that one there. <laughs> All right, thanks. And so, you know, I feel like it's sort of, a battle that's already lost if you're not aware of these things going in, which is to say that the world is set up for people who 
thrive being around people and who work best surrounded by other people. And so if that's not you already going in, you've got a huge challenge to navigate. And then yes. on top of that, if the expectation is if you look a certain way, you're kind of in one box, mm -hmm. you have that also to navigate. Yes. And so, and so um, uh, it's, it's just huge. And being writers, you know, mm -hmm. extroverts don't tend to go into careers of writing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right, writing oh. is the kind of thing you do in your closet by yourself, you know, yep. up late at yep. night or super early in the morning or on the beach, you know, all by yourself. And, and certainly it's a worthwhile endeavor and we all benefit from it. But, you know, how, um, how would you suggest based on your both experiences of being introverts, being black, you know, pursuing careers where you can thrive as introverts and maybe avoid some of the racism and, you know, all of that to an extent, what would you say to other people who are black and introvert, uh, you know, in terms of you know, trying to exist and survive and also thrive? Well, I would say, and I, I'm sure Lisa would agree with me here, that sometimes you have to fake extroversion if only for a little while. You know, sometimes you have to force yourself out of your comfort zone and speak up. But, you know, a way around that, if you're good at writing, if you have enough warning and you know a meeting is coming up, you can prepare your stuff written. You can send it to the person who's running the meeting and say, hey, I want to talk about this. And, you know, because you're good at writing, your ideas will be well expressed and you may get an, 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 an opening that you might not otherwise have got. Second thing is if your office has a quiet room, just go and sit yourself in that once a day and just get some downtime so you can relax. What do you have to add, Lisa? Uh, I, yeah, I agree with, with all of that, but in, in, terms, in terms of career, career choices, I don't think that there are any limits. Uh, it's just a matter of how you prepare. I mean, for example, I have a background in another life um, in the performing arts which some people find surprising because you don't necessarily look at somebody on stage sort of, you know, doing jazz hands and think this person is, is, intro, is introverted. That, is, that certainly appears extroverted, but I share that to say you can do anything. Um, my way of dealing with that, being, being in the performing arts was to, of course, you know, you give that your all while you're on stage, but then set aside some safe space and quiet time for yourself afterwards so that you have that balance. Um, uh, lawyers, for example, being, being a lawyer is another, I think, fantastic um, career option for introverts because you, you have to do a lot of uh, preparation and a lot of research, something that we're very, very good at. And then, of course, you practice. You practice when you have to. You practice your speeches, your opening and closing arguments. So this is not to say that as an introvert, you, you have to be squirreled away, you know, in a corner somewhere, locked away by yourself. Um, although if that is your preference, of course, <laughs> have at it. But, um, you know, you definitely don't have to limit yourself. It's just a matter of how you, how you approach, um, how you approach every day and each moment and ma making sure to give yourself time and space. Uh, uh, we, uh, we have been told that apparently um, President Obama is an introvert. Now, obviously, he spent a lot of his life in the public eye. So again, sharing that to say, it's not a matter of limiting your options. It's just a matter of um, sort of being true to yourself and playing to your strengths. Mm -hmm. although, although he's an introvert, he's also known as an excellent orator. But that's probably because he would do his research and he would prepare. You see? So... That's what I would say. Just, you know, be, be true to yourself. Don't limit yourself, but be, be if you are introverted, be aware of it. Um, educate yourself about it and, um, and, and play to your strengths. Yeah, agreed. Well, thank you both so much. That's author Sharon Hurley Hall and Lisa Hall, uh, the co-host of the Introvert Sisters. Uh, thank Thanks, you so April. much for being here.
Um, and so um, with that, we'll, we'll transition a little bit. Um, I did want to mention, just in our last session last week, we talked about wearing a mask, um, right? And getting to a, a place of healing where we feel comfortable taking that mask off and being able to show up as our whole selves. So I'm, I'm really feeling good about this whole process that we've been going through the past few weeks. And I do want to thank all of our uh, guests and speakers for sharing their thoughts with us 